currently in the middle of a series, um, a series of the Holy Spirit. Um, and for a lot of people, it's a topic that they don't know a lot about. Um, um, in, in a few messages ago, I said it's so interesting regarding the gifts of the Spirit, which the Word speaks a lot about. Um, it says that 87% of the church population do not know anything about the gifts of the Spirit or what their gifts are. And the Word says very clearly that God has given us gifts of the Spirit. It's something that we've received. And then yet in the church, um, out of 10 people, there's only one of them who actually functions in it and knows what it is. So, so we've been talking a lot about what the Holy Spirit is and what role He's supposed to play in the believer's lives. Uh, for many churches, it's, it's a topic that they try to steer away from because of what we've seen happen many times in other churches. And people get scared uh, scared off and they get freaked out because because what they might have seen or heard or uh, maybe experienced so what I tried to do throughout this process of this time was to try and bring clarity to clear things up so that people understand that the Holy Spirit is something that we need in our lives it's something that is so valuable and that without it we cannot function as God's children the way he's actually destined us to function so this whole week I've been kind of struggling with, do I prepare a different message for Sunday? Because we're going to have some of the families here that was here for VBS. And um, it's hard to, to get them in um, to where we are. But then I remembered, I, I recap every service. Anyway, so it's like a re-preach, which makes it really easy. I only have to prepare five minutes because it's 45 minutes recap. Um, and then there's five minutes of new information, which makes it really easy, as my good friend Dave tells me every week. Um, so... This week, I decided that we're going to do that. I, I, you know why? I thought, you know, I can, I can give you a message that is just a real seeker-sensitive, welcome to the church. God loves you. If you haven't been here before, we want to smack you on the back and say, you, you're good, and Jesus loves you, and we love you, and we hope you come back next week, and all those, those things. But somewhere along the line, I'm going to have to get real t with you and say, hey, the, uh, these things are in the Word. So we either teach them as the truth or we don't. And, and if, if I have to order it down or step back from it, it means that maybe I don't really believe it as being valuable. And, but, but I actually believe this morning. So, so just so that you know, I did prepare another, another message also. <laughs> it's that, that little bit of a fear factor that came in. So I did, did prepare a different message also. But then I realized this morning as I was pre uh, prepping both messages um, <laughs> and praying, God said to me, no. I want you to teach that. I want people to hear. I want them to hear about my spirit. I want them to, to hear how awesome he is and, and how wonderful it is to walk with him and to have him in your life. So that's what we're going to do. So, so that, is, that was my brief introduction to say that um, we are going on with the teaching regarding the Holy Spirit. And last week, I believe one of the main things that God has given us as a body, as a mandate for this body, God has given me the mandate to speak things in a simple way so that people can understand it. So I'm hoping that this morning that you will gain understanding regarding the Spirit of God in your life, that it's not something that you are scared of or put off by or not, not necessarily pursuing, but actually that becomes something that you pursue because it is, it is the greatest gift that was given to us. There, there's a whole lot of scriptures, and, and I'm going to recap the scriptures quickly. And it says, John 14, Jesus said to his disciples, and this is the same Jesus that you believe in for your salvation, same one who died on the cross, same one that walked on, on the earth as the Messiah. He said, I would ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you, and will be in you. So this is Jesus speaking. John 16, 7. Jesus said, But it's actually best for you if I go away. Because if I do not, if I don't, the counselor won't come. It's better for you that I leave. Because if I don't, the counselor won't come. If I do go away, he will come because I will send him to you. So if I go, it means I'm going to send somebody to you. He wasn't there before for every believer to have him access to him freely. At that point in time, the Holy Spirit only came on people that God wanted to anoint with specific tasks. So the Holy Spirit wasn't freely available for everybody. It was only on occasions that the Spirit of God came with power to bring God's might and power into people's lives. So Jesus said, I am going to send him. So where did he go? To the Father. Where is the Father? In heaven. So, so if he had to send somebody, where did he send him from? heaven so tell me have you ever received or heard that anything from heaven that's come to earth has been bad 
No. So we have to understand, if Jesus was up in heaven, he received, he, he mandated something from there for us to receive. And Jesus said, it's better for you that I go, because if I go, I'm going to send you one. And now this one is not just going to be there for occasion. He's now freely available to every single one of you that believe in him. So we have to understand that. Acts 1, Jesus said to, to his disciples, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. Wait for the gift my father promised that you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What's the word baptized mean? Immersed. For those of you that haven't been here uh, the first week here, as you can hear, the other people here, they are very well educated. They just know. What is the word immersed in, in Greek? Very good. Baptizo. Very good. Wow. This is awesome. Is it? Is it? No, it's not up there. Okay, just <laughs> baptizo. So, so that you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, and in a few days you will be baptized. You will be immersed, completely covered. So Jesus is speaking to his disciples, saying, you will be completely covered by the Holy Spirit. So in our lives, it's a gift that was promised to us. It's not just a gift that's for the seal of our salvation, but it's something that we are supposed to be immersed in. So when will you be baptized? Um, when you will be baptized, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all gathered in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a um, violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them to do. So we started speaking last week about what does it mean to live a Spirit-filled life? Because we are supposed to live a life that is consumed with God. And a lot of people, it's, it's hard to make that understanding because for me, when I grew up, church and relationship with God was, was basically the specific times it was dedicated towards. It was dedicated towards Sundays. It was dedicated towards the evening when I had to read my Bible and pray. And dedicated to meals um, where we blessed the food. That was kind of God's involvement in my life. Throughout the rest of the day, it was kind of just me on my own. But the Word says that we are supposed to live a life filled with the Spirit of God. Every single day of our lives, we are supposed to have the fullness of God and, and our lives filled with His presence. So week one, this is what we looked at. Here's the brief recap. Week one, we looked at what does the word spirit mean? Because a lot of people are scared of, am I going too fast? Are you guys still, are you still good? I'm going to go a little bit fast because we have to get through stuff. So if, if I'm too fast, just raise your hand and, and ask the person next to you what I said. Uh, <laughs> As person next year, that's going to be the quickest way to figure it out. So week one, what did we talk about? We talked about the word spirit, because a lot of people are scared of the word spirit. It, uh, maybe it's from movies or whatever it might be or what you've heard before. But the word spirit is actually nowhere in the Hebrew or in the Greek language, the original language that the Bible is written in, will you find the word spirit. There is no word for the word spirit. It's a word that we created, into, we created, we made a word in English to try and bring forth some or other understanding so that we can understand what the Spirit of God is or what, what the breath of God is. So, so the word Spirit in the Hebrew is the word, very good. Okay, and in, and in the Greek, if you can read, the word Spirit is the word, very good. So we've got two words for the word Spirit. In the Old Testament, whenever they spoke about it, was the word Ruach. Ruach means the breath of God. We planted Numa originally when we planted Numa and we prayed about the name for the church. Um, we, we felt that God said, I want you to be a body that's going to breathe my life into people. So when we decided on the name, we thought, Ruach. What church are you from? Ruach. Excuse me? Ruach. You want to clear your throat? You want a glass of water? What's going on? You know, so we started, no, Ruach might not work all that well. So we went with Numa because it's got the meaning, which means the breath of God. So whenever you read the Spirit of God came or um, the Holy Spirit, what it is saying is it is the breath of God, the blast of air, the powerful manifestation of the wind that comes. Okay, so we have to understanding of the word Spirit. So that's what we did the first week. Numa, Ruach, literally means the current of air, breath, blast, breeze. Week two, we spoke about you will receive power when the Spirit comes. So when the breath of God comes, when the wind comes, when the blast of air comes, when that happens in your lives, what will happen is He says you will receive power. 
Now, power is an important thing because without power, things don't function. Without breath, you don't, you're not alive. Now, we have to understand that we are born twice. We are born as human beings, and without breath, our bodies will die. And we are born again into Christianity. When we accept Christ, we are born again. And what happens then is you receive your second breath, which is actually the most important breath that you can receive, which is the breath of God that now lives inside of you, which is the Spirit of God. Now you receive power not only to live to be alive in Christ, but you receive power to make a difference. And we have to have this understanding that one of the most important things regarding the gifts of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit is the reason why God gave it to us. It's not so that I can be powerful, I can be mighty, I can do signs and wonders, do miracles, I can um, prophesy. It's not about you. You have to understand that God did not give you um, the Spirit of God because of you. He gave you the Spirit of God because of others. He wants you to influence, love, reach out, bring power forth so that others' lives will be influenced by it. Not so that you can build your own kingdom. God wants you to build His kingdom. And how do we do it? By loving others. So we have to understand the power that was given to us was not given for our own kingdom, for our own might and our own strength. Yes, there is power that will help build us up. But the purpose of us being built up again is the same reason why Christ came. He laid down his life because he loved the world so much. For God so loved the world. Why did he give his spirit? Because God so loved the world. Do you understand the principle of why spirit is given? So so we spoke about power. The power to to share Christ boldly. What? power to share Christ boldly. They were, these were dumb dumbs that couldn't speak before the disciples. And suddenly after they received the power of God, what happens? They evangelized 3,000 people at the first meeting, which is the same guys that couldn't speak. They couldn't convert anything. They were actually speaking incorrectly, but suddenly power came and they changed 3,000 people's lives. Power, the spirit power, whenever you are weak, he is strong. We looked at the power to have a hope in a hopeless world. The power the Holy Spirit gives us to know fullness of God. Without the Holy Spirit, and this is what the Scripture says, I love this. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to know the fullness of God. Without the Holy Spirit, you might have head knowledge. You might have Scripture knowledge. Maybe you know Scripture really well. But you need to understand that you will not know the fullness of God without the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. It's impossible. So you might think you know God. When I was in a church, a religious organization, I knew a whole lot of scriptures. I knew all the Bible stories. I knew about Jesus, New Testament, all the books. Most of them knew, knew most of it. But did I know God? No. I only met him the first time I got introduced to the Holy Spirit. And the guy said to me, you know what? God is not about religion. God is about relationship. But it's impossible to have relationship without the Spirit of God. So if you are hungry and saying to yourself, there has to be more to what I currently have in my religion, it is impossible to have more without the Spirit of God. Impossible. Okay, week three. We're almost at week five where we are now. So week three, we spoke about the power of spiritual gifts given to all believers, the gift of prophecy, the gift of faith, the gift of healing, the gift of serving, the gift of giving, the gift of leadership. And last week, um, after the service, during the service, kind of at the end, we had people that had pains in their bodies stand up and people had to pray for them. And then after the service, Linda came to me. She said, you know, I had one of the most amazing things that's ever happened to me I experienced I put my hand on somebody's back and I felt there was a lump uh, like a something that was at the on his back and I felt he asked for something else to pray for him and I felt God said put your hand there So so I put my hand on his back and I felt there was a bump and as I started praying I felt felt and I said to him are you feeling this she said to him are you feeling this and she started praying for him and as she prayed it disappeared in her hand we prayed for John's leg. Those of you that weren't here last week, John, that, that's on the crutches now, which isn't a really good testimony. You should really get, get rid of those things. I mean, come on. No. So that's, those of you that weren't here, it is, it is powerful because it touched my life. It, it, this whole week, I was looking for opportunities for, to pray for people that, that were hurt and injured and sick. John, we were playing slow pitch. John fell. His leg, his, his leg was like this. And instead of his knee being there, his knee was over here while he was lying on the ground and it looked terrible and uh, it was shocking and we went over and when we started praying and why do we pray because we love the man we we want to see god's miracle power flow through him not because i wanted to wanted to do a miracle 
Okay, it was because God, I don't want him to be hurt. I don't want him to be injured. So as his knee was sitting here, put my hand on top of it. Jay was standing behind me um, praying. I was praying over here, and we felt um, the knee moving, 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 moving to it was exactly back into place. No tears, no rips, nothing broken. When you, if you saw it, you would think completely differently. That was a miracle. So that's the Spirit of God. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit. And can I just call on it on any time? No, I can't. Uh, my track record, like I said three weeks ago, which is great that God actually changed that a little bit now. Um, before, my track record wasn't that good for praying for people with injuries or sicknesses or healings. It wasn't, I, I wasn't that effective. And then a week later, God brought this opportunity to say, okay, are you going to function in that spiritual gift that I've given you? Because it's not based on your track record. It's based on mine. So you have to respond. Say, yes, I am. So God, I will continue to do what you say I have to do. Right? So you put your hand and you pray. And sometimes what will happen is sometimes the kneecap will move the other way. It sits right there at the back. <laughs> no, but, but if we just obedient, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. J just keep doing it. Okay. Um, fruit of the Spirit is not gift of the Spirit. We'll get into that. Okay. Then last week we got to, to the one part which a lot of people are scared of, and this is the part which we're going to just get into a little bit now. It says, and they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them to do. And I said last week, at this point, this is when things got really tricky and very sticky because a whole lot of people are scared of speaking in tongues, don't know what it's about, and we have to bring some clarity towards it. So what did we learn last week from the gift of speaking in tongues? This is what we know from the Bible. We learned very directly that Scripture says that when someone speaks in tongues publicly, like in a church, the Bible teaches us that there should be interpretation. Somebody must be able to interpret it. Otherwise, the word says to us, be wise. Do not be foolish. People will look at you and think you're crazy. They will go the other direction. Be, have wisdom with when you speak in tongues. There has to be interpretations if it's in a group of people. 1 Corinthians 14, 27, 28 says, If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or, th or at three, the most should speak at one time. And someone must, someone must interpret. If there is no interpretation, the speaker should zip it. That's my translation, zip it. The speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Now, a lot of people say, okay, well, I'm not sure if I believe in all this whole speaking in tongues things or if it's real or it's not real. Um, let me ask you, how many of you believe in salvation? Awesome. So if you believe in salvation, okay, and where did you get the salvation scripture from? The Bible, right. So uh, where, this, is, this 1 Corinthians 14 thing, is, this, is that part of the Bible? It is. Biblical. It's in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 14, 23. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Yes, they will. So that's why we don't do it. Unless there is interpretation. The second thing that Scripture is very clear about regarding speaking in tongues. The Bible teaches us that speaking in tongues strengthens the person speaking, not the entire church. So if you're speaking in tongues, it is for your benefit, it's not for the benefit of the whole church. So if we have the mindset in the heart of Christ, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, so the ever believing will not perish, but it will have it everlasting life. If we have the same heart as Christ has, because His Spirit lives in us, it means that when I'm in a congregational setting where we gather together, my heart and my focus is on loving the people around me. Personal edification can happen at any other time. Right, so let's focus on what the purpose of the body, gather, the body gathering together is for. First Corinthians 14, Paul said, A person speaking in tongues is strengthened personally. Is that the Bible? Is that the Word? He says, the person speaking in tongues. Now, a lot of people say that speaking in tongues was dispensational. It was for the disciples. Who is Paul speaking to? Who is he speaking to? Corinthians, when he speaks to the Corinthians, it's called the Corinthian church. Was the Corinthian church 12 disciples? No, it was one of the biggest churches in the area. So who is he, who is he speaking to? The church, believers. So this is not a dispensational thing. This is not something that, that came and passed away when the last disciple died. This is something that is relevant for the church, but we have to use it for its proper use. Because if it's being abused, What's going to happen is it's going to cause problems. 
and that great gift that God has for us it will become something that's scary and people don't want it anymore. And that is what has happened in a lot of places. So a person speaking in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. What does the word prophecy mean? Speak on God's behalf. So on Sunday morning, sometimes when we preach, we hope most of the time when we preach that we're speaking on God's behalf. What's on God's heart? But it's also a prophetic word for people personally. It can be for a congregation. It can be over a nation. There's, there's many prophetic words out there. So you're speaking on God's behalf. So speaks on God's, uh, God's behalf. I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. The first thing Paul said about, about, about this, he said, listen, guys, it's about love. If you have the gift of speaking in tongues, if you speak in tongues as men and angels, but have not love, you are only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. So I understand that again with the mindset. And I hope you guys are staying with me because I'm trying to bring clarity about some stuff that might seem weird to a lot of people. I mean, some of you might not even be believers yet, kind of not sure about this whole church thing yet. And I'm talking about speaking in tongues and, and it's wind and earth, earth, wind and fire. Um, <laughs> great band. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, but, but please stay with me because I believe as we get through this, you'll have clarity and and if your heart stay open, I believe God will speak to you directly. So, so be open to it. Just hear what the Word of God is saying. You have the gift. Do not be a resounding gong and a, and a clanging cymbal. But rather, let's speak into people's love, uh, into people's lives. Verse 18, you can almost hear the tension. It's almost like saying, enough of this going after gifts. Because you are missing it if you think it's about the gifts. It's about people. He says the following, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. It is a gift from God and it is valid in verse 19. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue, which is awesome, right? right? Why? Because he's got the heart of Christ. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me being built up, me being strength. And I know a lot of people, uh, we have this mindset, if anything wrong with you, go to church. They'll fix you. So when people show up to church, what's the thing they want to do? God, I need, I need, I need. And if you understand how the kingdom of God works, the kingdom of God works with the principle of sowing and reaping. If you want to see change in your life, start changing and influencing other people's lives. Those of you that were serving here this week, let me ask you, how many of you were, is there any of you that weren't inspired by seeing young people dancing? Like how many of you are so exhausted that you can never serve again? Let me ask that question. Anybody that's so exhausted? How many of you are actually strengthened in your faith because of what you've done? Two, three, four, five. I'm counting, I'm counting. I'm <laughs> the lights aren't good. So, so we have to understand that the principle is if you want to see change in your life and you might be here this morning and you need something in your life, start serving in God's kingdom. That's what Christ did. His whole life he was serving people. And I know we, we keep telling people, model after Christ, serve Christ, serve Christ. Well, a lot of people think serving Christ means Jesus, I want from you. Where in reality, serving Christ means I'm going to walk as you walked. I'm going to do what you did. I'm going to love other people. I'm going to serve other people. I'm going to get out of my comfort zone and maybe do something that I don't necessarily like doing. But because I know God has placed it in my heart, I'm going to respond to this. I'm going to change somebody's life. Amen. Good. said, I would rather say five words to a body that they understand. And I, I wrote down these five. Jesus loves you a lot. I wasn't sure if a lot was one word because then it would have been four words. Jesus loves you a lot. If we can share that with people, make that our hearts, instead of being so self-focused, man, we'll see this body of Christ infiltrating this world and changing communities. Okay, now, do you believe in the gift of speaking in tongues is valid for today? Yes, I do. I think the more pressing question is the following um, that I believe most of all should ask. Do you have to speak in tongues to say that you are filled with the Spirit? Is that the only evidence of somebody being filled with the Spirit? No, it's not. It is not. Not one of the scriptures saying that that is it. It does say that they baptized them, they laid hands on them, they baptized them with the Holy Spirit, and the believers spoke in tongues. It does not say all of them spoke in tongues. It does not say it's the only proof that people were, were filled with the Spirit. I know people who are filled with the Spirit where I've seen the gift of the Spirit work through them by laying hands on sick people and people being healed and recovered. 
I've seen people filled with the Spirit speaking words of wisdom, having the spirit of discernment, having the spirit of understanding, words of knowledge into people's lives, and these people do not speak in tongues. So do not think that you have to speak in tongues to receive the, the gifts of God. It is a gift. Paul does say, I desire that all of you speak in tongues. Why? Because for me, personally, it is my tool. When I, when I don't know, and that, I know this might surprise all of you, but that does happen. <laughs> no. When I don't know, happens often. So, because I, so I tap into this gift a lot. All I do is I say, God, I don't know. I don't know what's next, where to go, what the answer is. When I'm busy counseling people and it looks like, oh, we've reached a wall that seems like it's a great wall of China. There's no way getting through this, over us, or around us. It seems like people can see it from space as the ninth wonder of the earth. In those moments, I start speaking in tongues in my spirit, not loud so they can hear it, not up. And then it's almost like the miraculous happens every single time. Every single time God gives a word of instruction. I mean, Greg, there's a great testimony where, where Greg is sitting. I'm just going to tell it to you. Greg is sitting in a, and I'm going to ad lib it. So it might be more impressive than it was. <laughs> this is what pastors do. We've got a great gift in that. So he was sitting um, at a coffee shop and um, he was, let's, I don't know what he was doing. He was there at a coffee shop drinking coffee. And he saw a table at the um, opposite end, two guys sitting down, and um, the one guy stood up, and he went to the washroom, and God said to Greg, you have to go to that guy and say to him, stop beating your wife, right? Stop beating your wife. And, and the guy was big, like he was my size. He was like, <laughs> and Greg is like, right? I mean, <laughs> Greg is like here, right? So, so the guy was big and felt intimidated immediately, uh, and he said, but, and God said, well, what made you decide to go? If you put, if you did something, you'll go. What? Oh yeah, yeah. So, so Greg said, God gave him the word. Go tell that guy stop beating his wife. And Greg said, if the other guy leaves, I'll go. So the other guy stands up and he leaves. <laughs> Which is kind of seriously, that's one of the worst tests you can put out there because that's like logical. Anyway, so the other guy leaves. Like you should have said, if the other guy stands up on the table and yells something out. Make it harder. So, so if the other guy leaves, I go. And then what happens is the other guy stood up and he left. And Greg went over to the guy and he said to him, Dude, stop beating your wife. No, he didn't do it that way. Went with love. Right with the heart's attitude of saying, it's not, I'm not here to judge you or condemn you. I'm here to bring life into your life. God's given me the word. You have to stop beating your wife. And the guy received it. What happened? He beat him. He beat him up. He actually made him shorter. Like he's now like here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Went pale and received it. And 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 again, a lot of people think, "Oh my goodness, how many of my secrets are gonna come out in church?" No. <laughs> uh, don't worry about that. Uh, we had a big guy from South Africa. He used to be a bodybuilder, a, a chucker outer in restaurants and bars and everything else. And he used to stand by the door. And he, he was South African, but he was very South African. He had a deep voice. And he was like on Sunday mornings, like, you know, hello. And he gives you a hug. You know, give me a hug. And he was a big guy hugging people. The back in South Africa now, Dan Vessels, we love you. We miss you. Um, so... He came to me the one Sunday during the morning. He said to me, you know, like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And I said to him, what's wrong? He said, you know, it's like when people come through the door and I hug them, God says to me, this guy's doing this. And I, and I just want to rip his head off. And I said to him, Dan, you're a greeter. You're like the first line of defense. God shows you what's going on in that person's life so that you can love them and stand in the gap for them. And say, thank you, God that I love this person no matter what they've done. Christ has forgiven us no matter what we've done. So I'm standing in the gap. I'm going to intercede for this person. And God, I pray that you touch him this morning in that area. Right? So God reveals in the church not to bring shame, but to bring healing and restoration. That's his heart. That's his heart for his body. So the question is, um, are speaking tongues the only evidence? No. What is the best evidence of a spirit-filled life? It is a believer who exhibits the fruit of the Spirit all of the times, even when it's hard. And, and sometimes, you know what, I, I, I want to use this term because sometimes we can step out of the Spirit. 
And I've done that once <laughs> this morning. And <laughs> no, I've done that, right? Where I've stepped out of God's spirit. And what I mean by that is out of the, the way he would do things, out of his ways of, of loving people. And the fruit of the spirit means those, that's the fruit of somebody who functions with God's spirit in their lives. Is we'll, we'll see the fruit. It's like, how do you know what kind of tree it is? You look at the fruit. That will tell you what kind of tree you've got. So when you, if you constantly, every single part of your day, you're trying to battle through things and you're never getting a hold of something and the wrong fruit keeps popping up, it might be because you are not functioning from the Spirit of God, which is something which you can do. You can bring change in your life and change the way you do things. It's something that God's given us. I'm giving you a gift. I'm sending somebody to you that you're going to need that can change your life. So, so um, I wrote this. That's what it must be like when you're around Jesus. And I believe that's what a person who is a spirit-filled person functioning with the Spirit of God in their lives, people will say when they talk about you, that's what it must be like to be with Jesus. Because of the love, the acceptance, the patience, the kindness, the faithfulness, the self-control. And while you are there, I'm telling you, because of the love, the, the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit are going to flow because you've got the fruit. The gifts do not flow without the fruit. If you do not have love, the gifts won't come to perform miracles to show off. It functions from love. It's like that's the switch. Like if you've always wanted, man, I really wanted that gift. I got, check if there's love. Like if we don't love people, those things are not going to work. We have people showing up to conferences, and I've been one of those that I want to go to to receive power. Man, I want to go out there, and after this healing evangelist, I want to start praying for you. And you know what? I've never loved the people once, but I like the manifestation. I like to see a, a, somebody's arm grow or, or somebody in a wheelchair stand up and walk. And, and you are asking, do those things happen? Yes, they do. We, we have a friend that's preached here before, Robert Ricciardelli. His mandate from churches across the world is to go and authenticate miracles. So he will go to doctors, houses, homes, after a miracle has been documented, or somebody says they've received a miracle, his job is to go and authenticate it. And he said, as, but he said the sad part is, as many of them are real, they are fake also. So you find both. But don't think because the enemy is trying to steal something that is life-changing and, and buying by just bringing the lies into it. Don't think it's not real. It is real. God has it for us. So Galatians um, chapter 5, 16 says the following. Here's what Paul said. So I say, live by the Spirit. This is Paul speaking to us. Live by the Spirit. How many of you love Paul? I do. I mean, he's amazing. Um, this, the The knowledge and the wisdom and the insight and the life-changing application he's given us in his word is just one of those amazing things we love paul it's the same paul that that we know that says i've got a thorn in my flesh same guy he says the following if you like to cling on the thorn in the flesh scripture and and thorn in the flesh for some people it means you know it's my ailments my sickness my disease that was not paul's thorn in his flesh that that was not the thorn but if that is you and you like to use that scripture in the past, I want to say to you, then you have to use this one also because it's the same guy. Right? He says, live by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Or keep in step with the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. That's him. He said, so I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of your sinful nature. You won't be continuing to live in sin if you live by the Spirit. For the sinful nature, our flesh, our bodies, the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit. And the Spirit was contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not know what you want. Why is that I struggle so much and others seem to get victories where I struggle? It is because they choose to live by the Spirit and not by the sinful nature. They may have learned to be more yielded to the power of the Spirit because your fleshly nature, um, selfish desires, will war against what the Holy Spirit wants to do. So this is where I really want to go this morning, and I've got 10 minutes. Okay. Ephesians chapter 5, 15 to 18. So, be very careful how you live. Okay? Good start. Hear me. 
Be careful how you live. That, that already is like, oh, that's great wisdom. When's the last time somebody said that to you? Because all we constantly hear is, do whatever you want. Just do it. Just go for it, man. Whatever it is. You only live once. No, you don't. He says, be careful how you live. Make the right choices. Okay. So be very careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. And not by going for the evil things. Because that's kind of what people think. Ah, in these evil days, make the most of every opportunity. That's like a, it's a good, good to go for everything. That's not what he's saying. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Here's the scripture. Here's the key verse that we're going to focus on. Don't be drunk with wine because you will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want all of you to say, be filled. Be filled. Not filled, filled. <laughs> be filled. There you go. Very good. Okay. Now, when someone is drunk, what do people say about them? They basically say, you are under the influence of alcohol. They're being controlled by or they are under the influence of alcohol. So if somebody is drunk, it means that they no longer have 100% control of everything that's happening around them. When you're under the influence of alcohol, you think differently. And I've read this. <laughs> you talk differently and you act differently differently. When you're under the influence of alcohol, you have different thoughts, you speak different words, and you have different behaviors. I used to, when I was in university, uh, there were rough days, but I had one friend, and he was small. But if he had a half a beer in him, he was the biggest dude out there. He could take on everybody and anybody. But in reality, He's, he should lose against his own reflection because he's like, if a hard wind picks up, we're scared he's going to blow away. He was tiny. His behavior changed. Before, no aggression at all. Calm, great guy, laughing the whole time. Half a beer, and suddenly the monster comes out. It was amazing. He got under the influence of it. So don't be under the influence of alcohol, but he says, but be filled with the Spirit. Be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So when you are under the influence of the Holy Spirit, what will happen? The following. You will think differently. Amen. When you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, what's going to happen is, after you've done something wrong, the Spirit of God, and now this is where a lot of people think the Spirit comes to condemn us. No, the, the, Spirit, the Spirit comes to lift us up. The Word, and you have to understand the purpose of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people think the Holy Spirit is sitting on your shoulder, convicting you of all your sins. And this is a, one of the most important principles, which I believe most in this body already knows, but I want to say it again. The Holy Spirit, when it says the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, that word sin there is a singular sin, one sin. The Holy Spirit only convicts you of one sin, one. What is that sin? Rejecting Christ. One sin. The moment you accept Christ, the Holy Spirit's conviction now changes into something different. What does He do now? He reminds you of the righteousness you are in Christ Jesus. Now, some of you are going, what? Holy Spirit, I'm going to one sin. How can that be? Okay, the one sin is the moment you've accepted Christ, what happens to you? You receive the full payment for all sin. Because what did Jesus Christ do on the cross? Died for all our sins, right? So do we have to go and name every, in, every individual sin that we've ever done wrong? No, that's why the Holy Spirit convicts us of one sin, rejecting Christ. Once you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He no longer convicts you of that. Why? Because now Christ lives in you, and He lives in you with the purpose to remind you that He's created you for a purpose, and you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's His purpose. 
So there's two roles of him. And we have to under, make that understanding that when the Holy Spirit is there as your counselor, what does a counselor do? Does a counselor in a court stand up and say, um, when the accuser, who's the accuser? The enemy comes and accuses you. Does the counselor, your counselor stand up and say, I agree. No, no. He stands up and says, Father God, what the enemy is saying, no longer true. Because my defendant is washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of that, he is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and he's no longer guilty. Any accusation that he might bring is false. It's not true. So the Holy Spirit's job in our lives as believers, it's not to tell us what we're doing wrong. But it is when we are doing something wrong, he's not saying, oh, you're doing wrong, you're messing up. He's saying to you, you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, man. Rise up to who you are. Don't get angry at simple softball games. I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know if that's relevant, but <laughs> might be. Look, <laughs> Dave. Um, <laughs> I'm actually talking about, it's me. Um, don't get angry at stuff that where, where you're supposed to have shown by fruit. Man, that fruit's inside of you. Show the good fruit. I've got that fruit inside of you. The good fruit is there. Show that. That's what I want them to see. Because that's what's going to bring change in their lives if you keep showing the good fruit. Right? Okay, so... So why do people drink alcohol? The answer is to get drunk. Yeah, now let's be honest. When you were young, how many of you took your first shot of tequila and went, man, that's good. Woo! That's just, woo! Oh. Right? How many of you just love the taste? Or your first sip as a, as a beer, as a kid, when you would like, uh, there's very few kids that can honestly say when their dad offers them their first sip of a beer, that go, I, uh, most of the kids I've ever seen goes, ew, and you guys drink this? So it's an acquired taste. <laughs> it's an acquired taste. It's something that we get used to. Originally, when young people drink, and that's where it starts. Most people start when they in high school. It is drinking with the intention to get drunk. And now, please don't be offended because I'm saying that you're drinking now to get drunk. I know some of us have acquired the taste. I love a glass of red wine. I do. I love a cold beer on a hot day. It's great. After you've worked hard and you have an ice cold beer, it's great. I don't drink to get drunk anymore anymore <laughs> anyway so why do people get drunk or why do people get drunk because this 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 is the reason and I'm talking about people in adult world now that that have um, I'd say have a problem with it also that you can almost find weekly in this state they get drunk because they want to be comforted they want to feel an ease for all their problems. They want their problems to disappear. It feels like it's, it's causing the problem, that they can forget about it for a few minutes or a few moments because it gives them confidence, because it helps them to forget their sorrows. Or it's just because all their buddies are doing it and they're going to do it also. Right? They want to be in with the crowd. What happens is when you're drunk is, you are less aware of the physical things around you. I said I. I should have said they. They are less aware of the physical things around them. And your physical limitations and abilities or problems somehow now don't seem like a problem anymore. And this is what I said. I think this is, it's interesting how a substance in this world is a very bad counterfeit of what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. Because when we function from the mindset of the Holy Spirit, what's going to happen is you are going to be less aware of your limitations. 
your physical limitations. You're going to be less aware of the problem that's in front of you. You're going to be less aware of your own abilities because you are functioning from where the spirit is. So what alcohol has done is it's, it's a very bad counterfeit. I said, um, when you drink to, well, I drink to, to give me confidence to try something I can do. I said, now check this out. When you are under the influence of the spirit, alcohol, alcohol may give you the confidence to attempt something that you couldn't do. But the Holy Spirit will give you the ability to do what you cannot do in the form of a spiritual gift. Supernatural gifts from God on high given to every believer to serve the church and make a difference in the world. Then when you experience the presence of the Holy Spirit, just like a drunk who will do anything for another drink, when you truly experience the Holy Spirit, you will do anything you can to get more of God's Spirit. Because you've, you've tasted something. To be in His presence, to be filled with His power, to be transformed by His goodness, to understand His comfort and His guiding and His power, to give you hope in a hopeless world, and the gifts and the fruits that will move in you and through you so that you can live a supernatural life in a very natural world. That's what will happen. Now, how many times do you have to be filled? And I'm, I'm finishing with this. How many times do you have to be filled? Because there, there's, there's a big debate over this also. So at the moment of salvation, what happens to every believer? The Word says the following, that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. When I receive Christ as my, Holy, as my Lord and Savior, I'm sealed. There's like a seal, a stamp. Almost God's seal is placed upon me. It says in Ephesians 1.13, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, was sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So you are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. When you receive salvation, you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, what about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Something different. This is in Acts. Jesus said to his disciples, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father will send you. Let me ask you this. The disciples at that point in time, do you think they were believers? Yes. So have they been sealed with the Holy Spirit? Yes, because they've received salvation. So he says to them, do not leave, because the Father will send you a gift that I've promised you. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When you will be baptized, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. So how many times did that happen? So Jesus was, was in salvation. We get the seal of salvation. Now I'm sealed for salvation. Now Jesus is saying, I've got gifts for you that I want you to function in. So there's a baptism, an immersion of the Holy Spirit. It's not that we're going to go into water again, but we are baptized with the Holy Spirit. How do we find it in Scripture? We see it at times, it was laying on of hands, and at other times, it was just praying over people, and they received it. So here's the question. How many times do I have to be filled? And um, I'm going to finish off with this example to show you something. The reason of being filled is with the purpose to do what? We want to make a difference in people's lives. That's the reason why we get filled. I don't get filled so that I can just puff myself up. I used this example at, at the Christian school the other day. I didn't, I, uh, the message was much shorter um, because they're in kindergarten and grade one, and I think it was up to grade three, so I couldn't go through the whole thing. Um, but um, I used this example, and, and it is impactful because it shows you the effect of what the Holy Spirit wants to do through you. The Holy Spirit wants to use you, not just for you to be filled, but He wants to use you to make a difference in other people's lives. So I'm going to do this. So the Spirit of God wants to work through each and every single one of us. So I'm filled with Him with the intent to make a difference in other people's lives. So He wants to reach through me. He wants to reach you. And this thing doesn't reach that far. But, um, but the goal is He wants you to be filled so that you can reach out. Now what happens is I've given out. Right? I've given out. So what happens now? I get filled again. 
every single day, I get filled to make a difference in people's lives. And I give him out. I give his fruit out. I give him out. I give his spirit out. Everywhere I go, I infiltrate people. I make a change in people's lives. But every single day, I have to be filled again. And that word filled there that Peter used, uh, that Paul used there, it's a continual filling. So how do I get filled? Open up his word. Close your eyes and talk to him. Sing songs of worship. Be aware of his presence. Pray with your family. Serve someone. Use your gifts. That's how we get filled. Now I want you to know, God's spirit is not something weird or wacky. It's actually one of the most amazing gifts that we can receive in our lives. So if this is new to you, I understand many people, you might have more questions regarding this. Um, we have, there's five teachings on our website now regarding the Holy Spirit where I go into more detail. I encourage you to go listen to them. And just look at it and understand that our Father said that I will not give you a snake or something bad for you. I've got good gifts for you, and we have to trust that. So, so let's close our eyes. Let's start with that. Because the first step before receiving the Holy Spirit is acknowledging that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Say, Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And with the intention, why? Because He loves you. Christ loves you. He loves you unconditionally. So the qu first question I have is for those of you that say, I have not received Christ yet as my Lord and Savior. And I want Jesus in my life. I want, I want Jesus in my life because I know He's good for me. I know He died for my sins on the cross. And I acknowledge that I need Him. So if that's you, all I want you to do is you can just raise your hand. Um, nobody else is going to see. Raise your hand and you can take it down again. If you say, I want Jesus in my life, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I want Jesus in my life. I want him to make a difference in my life. I need him. That's fantastic. I'm going give to you, give you just one more opportunity. Great. Thank you. I want Jesus in my life. I receive him. Okay, now I want everybody to pray with me. All of you, those of you that are believers and not believers, um, um, and that said yes this morning, you are a believer now. I want you to pray with me. And this is your words. Everybody pray, please. Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you that I'm sealed with your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you died for all my sins on the cross and that I am truly now in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.